You know, one of the things that I think has been quite striking today has been uh, the kind of narrative around the role that the monograph plays in the process of research in the humanities. And this isn't something that is new to me. I think uh, it was a key theme that came out of Jeff Krosick's work on this question a number of years, years ago. Um, but I think out of it emerges some really important questions that we, that we need to address in this debate about open access monographs. One of them is, is that if the monograph and the process of publishing research is itself intrinsic to the research process, then for me what follows from that is that the skills and the knowledge associated with publishing and uh, working in, in that way to produce a monograph are themselves research skills. So one of the most striking little factoids that I will take away from today is that PhD students in art history don't have training in copyright as part of their research training. Um, that is actually quite surprising to me. That's a bit like I'm a natural scientist. That sounds a bit like me saying that natural science PhD students don't have training in statistics as part of their research training. It sounds like a really important tool that those researchers <coughs> ought to have. And I think that that's an important follow-on from that, that idea of the monograph as central to research. And also related to that was a comment that, that uh, Martin made right at the beginning, where he said we needed to ask the question where the publishers were the providers of services to researchers, or whether they were academic collaborators in the research project that results in the monograph. And I think the answer to that question, it's important to, to kind of frame it not as a, uh, necessarily do they have to be all of those things, but <laughs> publishers can make, take choices about the role they play uh, and the service and the type of relationship they have with their authors. And I think it would be really good to get more uh, transparency around that, particularly around the nature of the the services and the relationship. And you, know, you might observe that when we fund research, when we fund uh, collaborate, uh, well, when there are collaborators in that research, we fund them as part of the research. It's not regarded as something separate that is added afterwards. So uh, should we start thinking about research in the humanities around this, this object, the monograph as a research project, and the role that collaborators m might be publishers play in that? I think the second thing that I would take away from today is the positive tone and the general agreement on the, on the end goal that we're all seeking to achieve, and a real strong dose of pragmatism that has now entered this debate, um, that we all recognize that there are different visions of utopia that different actors in the system might have, um, but we can see that some of our visions of utopia have to be compromised in order to uh, achieve something that's better than we have now and enable the kind of innovative scholarship that uh, more openness will drive, which I think was a comment that Rupert made in the previous session. And the third uh, thing I would take out for, from today's discussion was the idea of diversity and how important diversity is in this space. And I think it's been woven through uh, all of the discussions today. Uh, Helen might say a bit more about it in the context of UKRI review in a moment. Um, but I think we need to think about diversity in different regards. Um, diversity of business models, of course, and I think, and I think we do want, uh, I think it is centrally important that we, uh, that we develop an ecosystem that has a diversity of business models and avoids monopoly domination. And I think that is the, the lesson from the journal's world, or, or the biggest lesson from the journal's world that we need to take on board. Um, that's why we were so keen as Research England to fun, fund uh, the Copin project, because we see that as part of that diverse ecosystem. We need to think about diversity of people, um, both in terms of, of uh, researchers and the recipients of research, and diversity in all its senses, in terms of, you know, Margot mentioned the Equality Act and the protected characteristics, um, but we also need to think about diversity globally and how the models that we put in place uh, have different impacts in different, uh, different parts of the world. Uh, and in different cultures. And I think that's a big challenge for policy in any space to deal with that effectively, and, and this one is no other one. Um, and we also need to make sure that we, have, we keep in mind the diversity of research and ensuring that, um, that uh, researchers are free to choose the questions they research on within the constraints 
of, of the, the research system that, that imposes on them. So one of the things that we've only touched on, and I think is the thing that, that, um, that is the biggest challenge for a policymaker in this space, is the question about the, the pace of change and the balance between carrots and sticks in terms of achieving that change. Um, my observation on that is that um, the pace of change, in my view, is currently too slow. Um, we've been talking about these issues for a very long time and made limited progress. But I think that has to be set against a pace of change that is realistic and achievable and doesn't disrupt <coughs> in ways that are unhelpful or uh, taking us in the wrong direction. So I think that's the challenge that I take away from the discussion today uh, and feeds into all the debates about UKRI policy and Plan S and the REF. And I'll stop there. <coughs> okay. Um, so I think I, I, I had the mandate to think about summaries from the point of a publisher. <laughs> so I'm not sure I can do it entirely. But one thing that came, came through, I think everybody agrees, that the BPC model is not going to work for monographs. Um, that's, a big, that's a big step if everybody just nails that down and says BPCs are not going to work. That, that in itself is a big step and, and thinking about alternative structures to support monograph publishing. Um, we saw the, uh, the CUP uh, OUP survey showing how important monographs were and thinking about, ab ab about ways of sustaining that at the level of the, of, of, of the academy as a whole. Um, and we've seen the roles that academic societies can play in this space. Uh, we've seen um, individual faculties taking on responsibilities as well. And we're seeing presses um, uh, taking on, on, on different roles in there. It, it comes back again to the point that Stephen just made that look, or, and, and, and others have made that one has to look at publishing no longer. I, I think publishing was an endpoint of a research program and a lot of people said, I've got it published, I can walk away, that's it. And I think one thing that's coming through now is that that's not the case, that publishing is neither the end point uh, in that, that academics uh, can and, and, and are increasingly taking on thought about what the dissemination of the of, of the book uh, is or what they want it to be, but also that it's coming back into the whole research um, line itself, and that this is this is part of the whole research process, and that the academy as a whole needs to be engaging with that and thinking about that as part of the research process. And for me, I, I remain. I mean, it's a wonderful audience that we have today. But on the whole, I think that the university leaders have been fairly poor in taking a leadership role in that. And I think that there's one thing that we could do as academics is, is put a little bit more pressure on, our, on the leaders of our, of our institutions, the academic leaders, to take open research and the publication more seriously within it. Uh, and I think a lot of what we're, we're seeing, in fact, the number one thing, pick on CUP, but the number one thing about open access was that it satisfied mandates. <laughs> and, and, you know, that we, we shouldn't have the, the research, we shouldn't have Research England <laughs> leading, telling us what to do. We should be saying this is how we can do it and let's talk about funding models to facilitate it. And I think it's really dangerous when we're being, f where, when mandates are leading the charge here. We're not taking responsibility as academic institutions to do that and I think we're failing. We need to get a few more vice chancellors in on the Agreed. on the uh, on on the case. Um, the other thing that I think uh, maybe wasn't discussed as much as before, but it was mentioned by the question, is the change in readership that open access. It's not just about changes in publication; it's really about changes of readership and how the the new readers are going to engage with scholarship. In, in, in the coming 10, 15 years. It's not just putting them on the spot, but it's also recognizing that there's the whole interaction that the readers are going to come back and expect things from the humanities authors. And also, humanities authors are going to be able to engage more with a broader audience. And I think that has got the potential to fundamentally change the types of research and what we are doing. Uh, and, you know, we spend a lot of time justifying why public funding should go into humanities and not into more drugs. 
and uh, and and one of and, and part of it is we it's hard to show that we've got this impact and this engagement with a broader population. If we can encourage that and bring that forward, I think that's just you know a super big win. And it would be nice to see more of that discussion coming through in the whole debates that we've got here, rather than just you know well we'll comply because I'll get promoted if I do this and I won't if I don't. Thank you. Um, so I have four points to make, um, kind of touching upon what we've discussed today and plus a mixture of my own experiences with open access. Um, so the first uh, point I'm going to touch upon is terminology. Um, and we've heard today, kind of, both for me, too many references to green and gold models. Um, and these are terms that are very much taken from traditional business models for journals. And I do wonder whether these terms are fitting for a policy for open access monographs, a policy that will predominantly apply to the arts and humanities. Um, somebody from the audience remarked earlier that green is perceived as inferior. So I wonder if we moved away from this terminology, then could we reconsider how green is perceived? Um, is it time to reset the conversation with regards to the terms that we use when we're describing open access? And we should not be seeking to replicate the policy that we have for journals over to monographs. And different disciplines call for different considerations of how to make research content openly available. See, so for today, art history will have its own set of considerations, for example, that might not be applicable to other subjects. <coughs> the second point I wanted to raise, and I've been really pleased to hear it being raised today, is the subject of equalities. And, and both Martin and Margot have, um, have touched upon this topic today. You know, we've heard that open access can offer a way in which scholars can access research for those who are not physically and perhaps financially able to visit a library. We've heard that open access enables scholarly research to be downloaded by readers from around the world. We've also heard that there are concerns around the potential for an open access policy to create inequalities and early stage researchers have been noted as an example of this. And as part of the UK, U, UKRI Open Access Review, we will be asking about potential inequalities. We'll also be asking respondents to think about the potential the open access policy might have to advance equality, diversity, inclusion, and what action UKRI might take to support EDI through its open access policy. So this is something that we are thinking about carefully I obviously encourage you to, to look at that part of the consultation document. The third aspect I wanted to touch upon was this issue around third party rights. And I think Nikki's presentation earlier really neatly kind of articulated some of the challenges of gaining permissions to reuse third party images. Um, I think it's important to note this isn't just an open access issue, it's a digital issue as well. And those two can often be conflated. Obtaining permissions, as we've heard, is time intensive. And you know, reflecting on what's been said today, I wonder if there's scope for a study on workflows from both an author perspective and from the perspective of staff working in, the, in galleries, libraries, museums, in order to understand those workflows better and to identify efficiencies. And Stephen's also touched upon this around PhD students who study art history and who are not taught about copyright. And this does seem to be a gap in training of the next generation of researchers. And what is the role or the duty of the institution to provide this training? Do funders play a role here? Can subject associations and learned societies perhaps help bridge this knowledge gap? It's not necessarily an open access issue, but I think it's an important issue to address. And I'm just going to touch upon book chapters as my fourth topic. Um, and the focus of today's conversation has been on books. We've had edited collections discussed as well. We shouldn't skim over the topic of you know, making individual book chapters open access too. So earlier this year, UKRI commissioned the British Academy to carry out a study on open access and book chapters. And the aim of this study was to come up with a definition of a book chapter, um, think about how many book chapters linked to UKRI grant are published, how many book chapters are returned to the REF, and what differences are there across disciplines. 
We were also interested in which, publish, which publishers publish book chapters and what policies for open access they <coughs> might have. And we're hoping that this study will be published over the next couple of weeks. And I'm ending on book chapters because this touches upon my own experience of publishing open access. Um, I have a chapter published in an edited collection which was published last month. I contacted the publisher directly to confirm its open access policy, which its website said uh, 18 months with um, an author accepted manuscript, which was great. The publishers were pretty unconcerned with the fact I was asking about open access, although they did point out that I didn't have to because REF 2021 doesn't mandate it. I said, no, I want to do this because it's good practice. Okay then. I contacted the library um, of the institution I was formerly affiliated with when I was doing my postgraduate studies. But I was told that because I'd completed my PhD and was no longer affiliated, I couldn't deposit my author accepted manuscript. Um, I've since spoken with some publishers and some colleagues in the department, and they've kind of suggested I raise it with the director of the library, which is going to be my next step. But on the back of this, I think it's to consider, it's important to consider the duty of care institutions should have to their postgraduate students after they've completed their studies. And again, this isn't just an open access issue, but perhaps as a very basic offer, institutions could allow former postgraduate researchers to deposit in their institutional repository. And this could certainly help normalize and demystify some of the aspects of open access publishing for early stage academics. I'm just going to make uh, three very brief uh, points. Uh, the first of them is that, uh, in my view, um, if we're going to take open access for monographs forward in a timely fashion, it has to be taken forward as a shared enterprise. A shared enterprise, by that I mean uh, a, uh, an enterprise involving academics as uh, content creators, uh, their uh, funders, uh, their uh, universities and especially, as Rupert has said, their university leadership, but above all their publishers. The relationship uh, between an author and their publisher with a journal is a very different relationship to the relationship of an author and their publisher uh, with a monograph. That uh, uh, we can go as far as to, as to suggest, as, as Martin did, that this is almost a co-production uh, relationship. But whatever, we want to, I think, avoid in the monograph space some of the uh, adversarial uh, activities that have characterized uh, the journal space over the last uh, few years. That's my first point. My second point is, on, in policy terms, I would reiterate what I, what I said in the previous panel. Uh, don't please let striving for perfection be the enemy of the good. And thirdly and finally, uh, in my view, this uh, kind of event uh, run by a university here, the University of Cambridge, is an exemplary event. If those of us who've come from other institutions could take that kind of message away to our own places and to try to get some kind of replication of, of, of this, uh, then I think that is what is needed to help to build some momentum, particularly amongst uh, our academics in the humanities and social sciences in particular, uh, behind uh, open access. Thank you.